One of the first <laughs> things I realized as I thought through what have I learned in 40 years was the what not to do's. But I'm not going to bother you with those today. I'm going to focus on the what to do's. And it starts with context. What's your future? What's it going to be? Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. And I learned that in the 1980s with a young, baby face looking Joseph Grenny. <laughs> when he and I decided we wanted to change an entire division of AT&T. How's that for a goal? In the 30 some odd years since then, Joseph, myself, us at Vital Smarts, we've decided it's a bigger goal. It's change the world. It's go where you can to influence for good and change the entire world. I also found it's a lot of fun if you change the world with people you love. And uh, that's my um, youngest son and oldest grandson in Mbale, Kenya, helping us to change the world. Lessons learned. When you choose your change objective, why not change the world? How about that be your change objective? Change the world. How do you do it? Well, you change the world one person at a time. One relationship at a time. One team at a time. One workplace at a time. One family at a time. One village at a time. One complex organization at a time. One city at a time. I don't know about you, but most of my future is ahead of me. So when planning for that future and looking ahead, maybe here's a few ideas that'll help you do your very best in that future. One of my heroes, uh, Stephen Covey, who passed away recently. When we were starting the Covey Leadership Center in the early 80s, I was really nervous. And Stephen was in attendance when I gave a presentation to a bunch of supervisors. I uh, finished and sat down and he took me to dinner. He said, can I give you some feedback? I said, yeah. He said, you're a good teacher. I said, well, thank you. He said, you're a good trainer. He says, you reach people really, really well. I said, thank you. He said, the only advice I'd have to give you is seek to bless, not impress. Seek to bless, not impress. What I realized is when you and I are seeking to impress people, that we're great and we're wonderful and we're smart and we're clever, our focus is on ourselves. And when you make a mistake, you go, uh-oh, did they see that mistake? What do they think of me? Other people don't make that kind of mistake. And we start doing this self-guessing. We uh, be self become self-conscious. And we end up making more mistakes. But when our focus is to bless others, I have some information that I think will make their lives better. And you make a mistake, you go, huh, that didn't work for them. Let me just brush that away and do something that will work for them. Let me make sure we're connecting in their understanding. And as your focus is on them, you actually operationalize a, pr a principle called start with heart. Your motives are about blessing. Your motives are about helping. And it's not about me. 
I found that to be one of the most important bits of advice I've ever received. And I pass it on to you in the same spirit I received it. Other lessons learned? Become the person you're training others to be. Become the person you're training others to be. You're training others not just to use some communication skills, not just to have a different way of thinking about influence. You're training them to become more effective people who are driven by mutual purpose rather than self-purposes at others' advantage. Now, I'm, I apologize in advance. I'm going to break a taboo. I'm going to use a word we don't use in business. I believe your work is about love and teaching people the skills of loving, to look for mutual purpose first. And it may be transactional. In this instance, what is our mutual purpose? But the more you use these skills, the more you think of mutual purpose, the more you start with heart and say, what are my motives? It starts being relational, not transactional. You're looking for a way that works for them because you want them to succeed. You want them, want them to uh, do well in pursuit of their goals. As you continue and persist with the use of these skills, it becomes beyond transactional. It becomes a worldview. That, in fact, you care about others. You want them to succeed. Even if they're in a little village of, in Bali, in Africa, far away, you want their lives to be better. Mutual purpose becomes a way you live and a way you see. Love is the word I would use. Mutual purpose is a little more business friendly. Um, as you become this person you're training others to be, something happens that changes you from a good trainer to a great trainer. The difference between a good and a great trainer is a great trainer trains with conviction. They know in their heart that what they have will be a blessing and help to others. Their own lives have been improved by it. And as they train it with others, they know that their lives will be improved as well. Now, becoming the person you're training them to be, that means walking your talk, right? But it doesn't mean being perfect. It means you quickly apologize when you make a mistake. Ah. Oh. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called you a fathead. Okay. You quickly apologize when you make a mistake. You let people know that you're a person in the process of becoming. You say, I don't always do this well. I'm sorry, but I'm trying. And they, you then, by doing that, model to them what you want them to become, a person who's becoming something even more effective than they were before with better relationships as a result. You don't have to be perfect, you just have to be trying. And the more you experience these things and wrestle with them, the better you'll be able to advise people and answer their questions and share your stories with them. Um, I also feel one of the most powerful things you can do to be an effective teacher an effective trainer, an effective speaker and presenter, is to use stories to touch people's minds and hearts. What I found is by telling heartfelt stories, people not only get the idea you're trying to make mentally, but they feel something in their heart as well. They associate with experiences they've had, and that tends to validate what you're telling them in the story. Now, you can tell this story by saying, let me tell you about what a, an experience a friend of mine had. And you could tell this story without pretending it's your story, correct? But as you work with these skills and live with your skills, as you contact participants after the fact and say, how's it going? What's happened? You'll begin collecting stories that are your stories. And so by mixing some of our stories with your stories, uh, you can use stories in a power
powerful, powerful way to teach and train. Well, let me summarize. Oh no, we gotta talk about your future, right? The future is not merely the result of choices among alternative paths presented by the present, but a place that's created. Created first in mind and will, created next in activity. The future is not some place we're going to, but one we are creating. The paths to it are not found, but made. To quote one of my favorite people, the best way to predict your future is to create your future. What future are you creating? Wish you all the best. Thank you.